All right, so now we've got a 70-year-old man with a large retroperitoneal mass that partially surrounds the kidney. Okay. Very good. So right away, you know that when you see a sarcoma in the retroperitoneum, a high-grade sarcoma, DDIF liposarc should be the top thing on your list. There are other sarcomas that can occur in the retroperitoneum, but the by far the most common one I see there is DDIF liposarc. So a pleomorphic sarcoma of retroperitoneum, to me, is DDIF liposarcoma till proven otherwise. In my book, personally, that's how I think of it. So um, hold on a second here. We have also... Oops, we got four slides here. Let me pull it up. There we go. And then let me show you, before we go into that, let's look at the, the imaging studies. So this is enormous mass here. And you can see here's the kidney and the tumor wraps partly around the edge, but really is, is pushing mostly in the retroperitoneum, just kind of grabbing the edge of the kidney. There's an important thing, though, to keep in mind here. When you see a large retroperitoneal mass that they think is a soft tissue mass, always think maybe it's actually not a soft tissue mass. Maybe it's a renal tumor that's pushed into the soft tissue, or maybe a GI tumor, or maybe a GYN tumor that's pushing out. And the, the opposite is also true. When you see a thing that is submitted as a large renal mass, if it's really big especially, it's possible that actually it's a retroperitoneal soft tissue tumor that just has encased the kidney. So I think it's important to keep in mind that sometimes radiographically even and, and intraoperatively, it can be hard for the for the, uh, the surgeons and the radiologists to determine if the mass is arising from the kidney or if it's arising from the soft tissue of the retroperitoneum and then secondarily involving the kidney. And that's true for the GYN organs and other and the GI organs too. So that's always important because otherwise you can get into your, if they tell you it's submitted as a large renal mass, then your brain starts thinking about all the renal tumor differential diagnoses. And you got to make sure that you don't you know, that you keep all the retroperitoneal sarcoma possibilities in mind too. So I've seen that happen before um, in the past. And then here's what it looked like grossly. So here's the kidney in cross-section. And here we have a very large tumor that has a variety of areas. It's got kind of gelatinous yellow areas. It's got white areas, kind of fleshy white to yellow areas, and lots of foci of hemorrhage and necrosis. And here's another view. And that's what the outside looked like. Yeah, there we go. And the very fleshy appearance, right? So let's go now back to the slides. So this tumor, big zones of necrosis, I'll show you this. Is, here's one slide, and we'll come back to this one in a minute, but let's look at the other. There's four of them. Here's another area. Yeah, very cellular. And another and another. So it's kind of heterogeneous. There's a lot of different patterns that we're seeing here in this uh, in this tumor. We've got areas like this that are kind of sp spindled, uh, fusiform spindled cells um, with a little bit of a mixoid background. These don't look wildly pleomorphic. They're atypical, but not super pleomorphic, except for occasional scattered multinucleated cells. And then uh, over here, there's more of that with some kind of uh, branching vessels little foci of calcification. This area has more of the, uh, a, a much more mixoid backgrounds with little tiny vessels, spindle cells, lots of mixoid backgrounds. Very like, look at a very delicate plexiform vascular network, almost like the almost vascular pattern. Wire. Exactly, the so-called chicken wire vessels that you'd see in a mixoid liposarcoma. And then this area I thought is pretty interesting because it has, and of course, unfortunately, the fold of the tissue happens right where the best part is. But this look, this pattern right here is, these are fascicles mm -hmm. that are kind of coming together at sharp angles. So this is what we call herringbone mm -hmm. pattern, right? Good, good. So herringbone is kind of a subtype of, um, of, a, of a fascicular pattern. And in the olden days, people used to say, well, if it's herringbone, we call it fibrosarcoma. And now we rarely ever call things fibrosarcoma in modern soft tissue pathology, unless it's a specific type of fibrosarcoma. Um, but usually we don't use that as a generic term anymore uh, because when you look at things that in the past were called fibrosarcoma because they had herringbone pattern, with modern techniques, most of those actually sort out and are 
classified as some other type of sarcoma. So you can have herringbone pattern in many different types of sarcoma and other non-sarcomas. And so back here to the first slide, so we've got this atypical spindled area that's, that's pretty solid. We've got necrosis, and then up here, what do we have? We've got fat, but it's not normal fat, right? The fat cells are multiple varying size, small, medium, and large adipocytes all jumbled together, and they have bands of sclerotic collagen, sclerosis or fibrosis running through them. And if we go zoom in on some of those areas, yeah, we'll see it. there are hyperchromatic atypical cells and there are maybe scattered lipoblasts as well. Lipoblasts are not actually required here for this diagnosis. They are sometimes present, but other times you won't have them. But what we want to find for sure, I think this one did have some lipoblasts though. I can't remember where they were. But what we do want to see though is this fat with sclerosis with hyperchromatic atypical cells. And to me, that's the triad of well-differentiated liposarcoma. So this component out here represents well-diff liposarcoma. And then down here, we have that transition into a cellular tumor that doesn't have, it has areas of hypercellularity that look like a sarcoma that don't have lipoblastic differentiation. So when you have a high-grade sarcoma without lipoblasts arising out of a well-diff liposarcoma, that is, by definition, that's a D-diff liposarcoma. Now, in the old days, we used to say you never have lipoblasts in these. But then we found that actually sometimes... They do have lipoblasts. Here's a couple. Mm -hmm. So usually a high-grade sarcoma with lipoblasts, a high-grade pleomorphic sarcoma with lipoblasts is pleomorphic liposarcoma. And those usually occur in the extremities. But we did find that there are some in the 90s, um, it was described that there were, um, there were some in the 1990s, that there were some papers that came out describing that there were tumors that looked like pleomorphic liposarc in the retroperitoneum. And with testing, it were found to be MDM2 amplified and or had areas of well-diff liposarc next to them. And so those obviously are just D-diff liposarcs that have lipoblasts. So I would say mo the majority, though, of D-differentiated liposarcoma, the high-grade sarcoma area will not have lipoblasts, but a subset, maybe 20% or so, 15 or 20%, will have some scattered lipoblasts in them, okay? So the key here, though, is when you find the area of well-diff and then you've got a sarcoma next to it, that is the definition of D-differentiated liposarcoma. Sometimes, though, you won't find any well-diff area. Sometimes these tumors completely seem to overgrow the well-diff component and will just be high-grade sarcoma. So in those cases, you can use fish for MDM2 or immunostains, although you have to be cautious with the interpretation of the immunostain. But I like fish, which will show MDM2 amplification in basically all of these tumors, okay? So this is a, but in this case, I don't think any, um, to me, no molecular would be needed here because we've got a definite, a well differentiated liposarcoma component right here with the obvious well diff with the nice big ugly cells there and they're not nice but a nice example of the big ugly cells and the collagen tends to be very homogeneous and sclerotic like this and then the the uh the d diff component is oftentimes more pleomorphic this one's not as pleomorphic as some but the d diff component can look a bunch of different ways it can have like almost any sort of pattern of sarcoma you can imagine it can look like mixofibrosarcoma with big pools of mixoid stuff and prominent vessels it can have areas that look very similar to mixoid liposarcoma with the little delicate chicken wire vessels like we saw in that other area um it can have a herringbone pattern it can have um a a heterologous uh, differentiation into other types of sarcoma like osteosarcoma, chondrosarcoma component. It can have rhabdomyosarcomatous differentiation, all sorts. It's I don't know what it is about lipo, uh, DDF liposarcoma, but it seems to have this ability to differentiate into like almost any pattern you can imagine. So a very, very unusual uh, tumor. So again, that's why you see a sarcoma in the retroperitoneum. Uh, it's probably going to be D-diff liposarc. Although I've seen malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors and synovial sarcomas and other things in the retroperitoneum. And surprisingly, for as, as aggressive and high grade as these can appear microscopically, they seem to have a lower tendency for metastasis than other types of high grade adult sarcomas. I mean, they, they still are a problem because of where they're located. And it's very difficult to cure patients of these because of where they grow. You can usually not it's hard to resect the entire tumor and just both for well-diff and D-diff liposarcs of the retroperitoneum, 
it's a surgically difficult site. The tumors are often large when they're discovered because they don't present symptoms until they're big. And um, because of that, the, the chance for recurrence, often multiple recurrence over time, is very high. And, you know, many patients with this in the retroperitoneum will often die either with the disease still in them and die from something else or die of the disease. It's very hard to cure, um, although that doesn't mean impossible, but it's, it's a very um, a difficult disease to cure in that site. But, um, but uh, also, though, it tends to sometimes be slower growing than you might imagine, you know, um, and the five-year rate of metastasis is much lower than, like, say, for pleomorphic liposarcomas, which are like 50% metastases at five years. These are a lower, lower percentage than that. I think it's somewhere around 20. I can't remember exactly, but it's something like that. Okay, so that's a good example of dedifferentiated liposarcoma. And again, each one may look different because the, the DDIF area can be very different from case to case.